Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are honored to have with us for our second in the Author Talks series, best-selling author, Patrick K. O'Donnell. Patrick is a historian, public speaker, best-selling author of 12 books and scores of films and documentaries spanning the American Revolution to the Battle of Fallujah. He is also a leading expert on America's elite and special operations units. I've personally read and enjoyed several of his books, most notably Washington's Immortals, uh, about the renowned Maryland 400, and our former President General William Gist's ancestor, Colonel Mordecai Gist, and the book Give Me Tomorrow about the men of George Company during the Korean War. Uh, Patrick served as a combat historian embedded uh, with a rif Marine rifle platoon during the uh, bloody Battle of Fallujah during the Global War on Terrorism, and worked as a consultant for Steven Spielberg's DreamWorks uh, on an award-winning miniseries some of you may have seen or heard of called Band of Brothers. I'm very happy to introduce our guest uh, in today's session, Patrick O'Donnell. Sir. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And um, it's a pleasure to talk to you about The Indispensables, which is for me, like all the books I've written, a great a journey. I enjoy writing each one of these books. Each one of these books is a passion of mine. And I enjoy the research as much as the writing. And I visit the places that I write about. I visit the, the homes of the men I write about. I visit their graves. And, you know, The Indispensables is a special book. It answers a question that I ask about every book that I ever write. Who cares? Why does it matter? It matters because if it had not been for the efforts of The Indispensables, the revolution would have likely been lost. And their role in the revolution is extraordinary in many, many ways. At the beginning, with the Massachusetts provincial government, providing crucial gunpowder, making the crucial decisions, as well as saving the army multiple times. First at the American Dunkirk, right after the Battle of Long Island or Battle of Brooklyn, where they literally rode on their shoulders, the Washington's army of 9,500 men and saved it from utter destruction. Again, at Pell's Point, Battle of Pelham Bay, where the army was being outflanked by an amphibious landing by Lord Howe, the Marbleheaders and Glover's Brigade in particular bought precious time that allowed the army to escape. And then finally at Trenton, here at Trenton, it's absolutely crucial. Every aspect of the operation that didn't involve the Marbleheaders failed. They couldn't cross the, 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 the Delaware River. It was only under the, the boats that were crewed by the Marbleheaders that got the army across. And then another important aspect is at Acid Peak Creek Bridge, where it was the Marbleheaders that sealed the fate of Johann Rawls' regiment by cutting off his final escape route and seizing the bridge. And then another aspect that nobody's ever told until this book, The Indispensables, is the role of a virus that was ravaging the army and how Marbleheader saved it. From that's a little bit of an overview of what The Indispensables is about. Now I'm happy to drill into the questions that you have. All right. Well, the um, for you folks that haven't uh, seen these before, the the series of questions that we're going to discuss with Patrick today were submitted by uh, compatriots, SAR members, uh, who have may have written the book or may have just been curious about the, uh, the history, but they've submitted the questions. We selected the best of those questions, um, discuss those with Patrick, and then we're gonna read the question and the uh, compatriot that submitted that question. Will, and the, the best three questions are gonna receive a free copy of the book. So our first question comes to us today from Brandon Gaines of the Texas Society. And the question is, was there a unifying motivation, uh, business or community for this group from Marblehead to take the actions they did to advance the cause of independence? Or were there a myriad of reasons that acting together would improve their chances of realizing their goals? There are a number of factors, um, the first being government interference in their lives. Um, and my opening scene of the Indispensables is a powerful one. 
you're, the reader is placed on board a, a ship, the pit packet, which is returning from a fishing expedition. The marbleheaders were um, fishermen and they would fish the Grand Banks. And they would also, they were also great traders and they traded around the world, the, the, the cod fish that they had fished and then they, they brought back other goods. Um, they're returning from a voyage and the ship is suddenly surrounded or boarded by the Royal Navy. And this is not a pleasant visit. This is a, uh, they're trying to imprison or impress the men that are aboard the ship to serve a, 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 along a, a, on the, in the Royal Navy. And this is a life service. It's effectively slavery or paid a pittance. And most men died aboard the ships that they served on in the Royal Navy. There was no going back. Didn't matter if you had a family or anything. Your life was suddenly taken away from you by the Royal Navy. And it was here aboard the pit packet, an early act of defiance and blood is spilled. It's really a dramatic scene. Um, during the scuffle aboard the ship, uh, a bag of salt is poured across the deck. And one of the main characters in my book, Michael Corbett, draws a line in the sand in the salt with his foot and says, if, if, if the Royal Navy officer crosses that line, he's a dead man. And that Royal Navy officer ignored the pleas and ignored the threat and moved forward. Uh, rather, you know, in a sense, very, um, in a sense, without, without much concern. And it was at that point that he received a harpoon to his carotid artery and bled out. And there was a scuffle that, it, that took place in a melee. Eventually the marble headers were, were rounded up and it was America's first super lawyer, John Adams, that tries the case. And this is a sensational case. And they are the, uh, Michael Corbett is exonerated of murder as well as the other crew members and they're, they're, they're let go. But this is an act of defiance from Marblehead, from a, a government that's 3,000 miles away that's trying to impose their will in many ways on, on the lives of the Marbleheaders. They impose their will uh, with excessive regulations, with um, trying to regulate their trade, for instance. And then what happens next is a series of atrocities occur that really start to ignite a political revolution within the colonies. The Boston Massacre, there's a Marblehead connection there with the man that actually performs the autopsy on Crispus Attucks, the first African-American that's killed in the, in the revolution. Um, it's Benjamin Church, who is a key member of this of the, of the book that I wrote. He's a key character, if you will, but has deep ties to Marblehead with the a doctor that's in Marblehead as well as his mistress. And there's a lot of intrigue around Benjamin Church as the book gets into. And this is a narrative history of these men and individuals and women as well. It's not a dry uh, history or telling of it, the story, but there's over a thousand end notes all, almost all primary sources, letters, diaries, et cetera, pension applications. But it's this interference that's constant that causes these men to bind together to resist, but they're also part of a community. Uh, Marblehead is a very tight knit community. Uh, everybody knows one another and the members of the regiment are often family members. There's father and son teams that go to war. Uh, sons are often drummer boys, for instance, uh, and they, they really know each other. But what's also unique about the Indispensables is Marblehead is a cosmopolitan town based on its, its trade. And there are many people from around the world that inhabit Marblehead. And it's a diverse regiment in terms of it's racially diverse but it's also diverse in terms of socioeconomics. The people that are fighting in the regiment are the elite as well as the poorest of the poor. And they all come together uh, in, in a special way. Um, they realize that their lives are greatly in danger by what the crown is doing. And I, I get into this later, it's, it's, it's about disarmament um, and, and gunpowder, which the Marbleheaders play a key role. But it's teamwork 
and these close bonds that form a unity that's extraordinary and exceptional of teamwork that allows them to do the impossible. And we talk about the American Dunkirk where it's the marble headers that saved the army um, and Washington's army at the Battle of Brooklyn where they, they cross the East River and the marble headers do it multiple times bringing the army across. Um, and it, it's, that's an extraordinary story which I can get into. And then also at, at, um, at the Battle of, of Trenton, it's the marble headers that saved the army once again. But it's that, that unity and close teamwork that is really um, indispensable, if you will. And it creates arguably one of the greatest fighting units in American history. I think a lot of the, the teamwork required to, to run a ship, the reliance on each other and all of the, the yes. way everybody has to pull together, like a sports team, tends to translate well into the military skill set. That's an, a, a very important um, aspect of this. These men were fishermen as well as merchants and life and death decisions had to be made on the high seas, especially the, the Grand Banks where, I mean, men died by the score every year because they're facing massive waves. The sea, the sea is unforgiving. And this teamwork and life and death decisions have to be made instantly. It didn't matter about the color of your skin. It was about working together and reliance and trust. And leadership is another important aspect. Many of the company commanders of the Marblehead Regiment were ship captains prior to the war. So you have an incredible skill set being brought to the, you know, to the American Revolution. Very good. Okay, our next question is from Rich Rosin of the Empire Society. And Rich says, or asks, states, many of us in the SAR are followers of the history of the Revolutionary War. While many of us are familiar with the Battle of Long Island and the Battle of Trenton that involved John Glover and the 14th Massachusetts Regiment, what was the most interesting thing you learned about the Marblehead seamen and what made them successful in these two battles? It was the, it was the unity that was formed on board ships in, in many cases in their leadership that allowed them to tackle these, you know, really complex mission impossible tasks. At the battle, at, for instance, at Brooklyn, the American Dunkirk, if you will, it's August 29th, August 30th, that night. The marble headers are instructed that they are going to lead part of the attack on the British, when in reality, they're moving back towards the East River. And it's then with only about two hours notice that they're told that they're going to take all the, the, the boats that are assembled. It's a, a motley uh, force of, of small craft, various sizes and shapes, and that they have to use those, those, those boats to bring the army across. And they quickly improvise. They, they take, um, they take cloth and they, they, they pad the oars to, to muffle the sound. Um, and it's here that I find, one of the things that, I found, things that I found very interesting is just how close to failure the entire operation was in so many ways. Number one, that night they board the, these small craft, they get people aboard and nothing cooperates with them. Uh, all the weather is working not in their favor at all. The wind isn't working, the currents, nothing is working. But still, you know, their skills are able to overcome these challenges. And it's quite interesting. The, um, the commanding officer of the entire umbrella aspect of the operation tried to inform Washington to call it off because he saw it wasn't working. But they weren't able to find Washington that night. So things proceeded to go forward. And then another thing that I found very interesting is the loyalists that were in and around Brooklyn Heights, one of them in particular tried to, to inform the British. And this is a you know, crucial information. Uh, rather than attacking, the, um, the Americans are retreating. Had the British been able to, to utilize that information in a timely manner and attack that night, they might have overwhelmed um, the Americans as they were boarding the boats, which was, you know, this is a, one of the most difficult military operations you can conduct in the middle of a, of a battle 
evacuate across the river. And, uh, you know, another aspect of it was um, eventually the tide, the tide and the winds change, but they didn't favor the British. That's another really extraordinary thing. Had the British been able to sail up the East River and intercept Glover's men as they were crossing the river, they would have blown the, this, this tiny flotilla of, of craft to smithereens with their guns um, and intercepted it. It would have, the army would have been lost once again. And then, um, of course, the, the, the really, truly epic thing that, that occurs as dawn is coming, um, a, a providential, as many say, fog sets in and screens the movement of the craft from the prying eyes of the British. And they finish the evacuation and save the army. Um, you know, I think that's, it, there are various things that I find interesting but there's something I'm going to bring out that wasn't really addressed in the, it is, um, I think the most in interesting thing that I found about this story was not necessarily their operations per se, but their role in combating a virus. And I think that this'll, this'll resonate with a lot of people because there's a lot of current events that occur in the indispensables that are very interesting. For instance, in 1773-74, the Marbleheaders bring home trading goods, but they also bring home an invisible enemy, a virus that's very deadly. It's smallpox. And it's the Marbleheaders that, that, that come up with an interesting way of dealing with it. They first try to quarantine people in pest houses, and then they come up with an inoculation hospital, which was really novel for the time. But inoculation is dangerous business. It's not necessarily an easy thing to do. It, it can kill you, literally. And they set up a hospital with their own funds. But this, the virus, divides the town politically. And the loyalists in the town use the virus um, as a wedge to um, further divide the town and also gain a, an upper hand. And um, they organize... Uh, about a dozen men that in the dead of the night burn the hospital to the ground with people inside it. I mean, this is really, I mean, talk about political violence. Miraculously, nobody is killed. But um, Glover, John Glover, who's a main character in my book, who's a very wealthy, self-made fisherman, along with Elbridge Gary and Jeremiah Lee and others, um, and Nathaniel Bond, Dr. Bond, who's the actual, he coordinates the, the inoculations. They, set, they talk to the local sheriff and they get a writ that allows the sheriff to arrest the perpetrators. But what happens next is really extraordinary. The, um, the loyalists in the town foment the mob violence where literally hundreds, if not a thousand people descend on the jail with axes and crowbars and break into it and free the men. And then what happens next is the homes of the men, the main patriots in this book are, their homes are surrounded by an angry mob and they're intent on trying to kill them. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's, there's many of, there's, there's cancel culture in this book. There's mob violence. There's the effect of a virus. And, you know, remarkably though, there's even a silver lining in terms of the virus, which we can get to later. It's it's amazing how things sort of cycle back and repeat. But I've I've told friends of mine that if you think politics today and the fighting and the and the stuff is is a result of any particular uh, person, place, or thing, then you don't you're not familiar with history because we have had we have had violent political fighting and arguments. Uh, it, since before we were a country. And that's just another great example of it there. It, and some of the stuff written and said about people back in the time through aliases and, and uh, the, the character assassination and whatnot is pretty incredible. It um, is indeed. All right, our next question up is from Guy Higgins of the International Society. And Guy says, I am certainly familiar with the exploits of the men of Marblehead and the regiment at Trenton, but I did not know that the regiment was involved in the formation of the Navy. As a retired Naval officer, this is embarrassing to me. Please expand. 
this is a detailed um, this is a detailed history, and I recommend that you look at the book. Um, but let me just sort of give it a bit of an overview because it's complex. But the heart of the question is it revolves around gunpowder. In 1773-74, the colonies had weapons, but they didn't have gunpowder, and the British knew it. This was the Achilles heel of the colonies. And the colonies in 1773-74 was going through a political revolution. This political revolution arguably begins in 1765 with the Stamp Act and the revolts against that. And then it continues and accelerates. It accelerates with a series of incidents and atrocities, the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, for instance, which involves many Marbleheaders, is collective punishment and results in something called the Intolerable Acts where um, judges are removed unless they're royal to the crown. The Port of Boston is closed. The something called the Fishery Acts takes place where the Marbleheaders will be put out of work. They can't fish the Grand Banks. Their livelihoods are completely destroyed by the crown and on and on and on. But also they try to ban um, the importation of weapons and gunpowder. And the early operations by General Gage is about attacking the Achilles heel and going after this crucial supply of gunpowder. And I really get into something which, which is not very well known. It's the Somerville Powder Alarm, it's called. And this is in early September, 1774. And what happens is General Gage recognizes that the Americans have literally hundreds of barrels of gunpowder and not much more. And he's trying to actively take away all the powder um, because he knows that it'll go the way of all the other revolutions that the crown has dealt with. And if you're disarmed, you can't revolt. It, you can you know, say as much as you want, but the, the, there, guns matter and it's power flows from the barrel of a gun as Mao Zedong said. And that's exactly what the British were gonna impose upon us. And um, the Somerville powder alarm is successful. Gage takes off um, a number of, you know, well, scores of barrels of powder from this powder magazine. But what happens is disinformation sets in and rumors fly that Americans were killed in the operation. And the truth is they, they did take the powder and that caused a massive alarm. People, thousands descended on Boston Common and, and, and literally were there to protest the disarmament because they knew what was coming next. And um, it changes the entire course of the revolution. Instead of a political revolution, it becomes an arms race where both sides are actively trying to get as many men armed as quickly as possible. Gage is trying to buy time for reinforcements. And he's also conducting or planning a series of raids to capture the ringleaders of the American Revolution, as well as capture the, more of the powder supplies. And it's the marble headers that are the crucial element in all of those operations. And they're the crucial element in gathering the supply of gunpowder. And this is very interesting. Most of the gunpowder at Lexington and Concord was gathered by the Marbleheaders through the inventory list that I was able to find. And they got it from the Dutch West Indies um, through trading there, but also or mainly through Spain. And they had a, um, an incredible series of contacts with the main trading house in Spain and this is a relationship that they had nurtured for decades. And the King of Spain knew what was going on and authorized it in, in, a, in a sense. Uh, it wasn't officially authorized, but he looked the other way and he allowed um, this trading house to, to trade with the marble hunters and the bulk of our supplies. Our first foreign aid comes from Spain in 1774 and we're bringing in the powder and the guns and it's coming, basically what's going on is the marble headers convert their fishing and trade routes into supply routes that are, that are arming and supplying the um, Massachusetts provincial government, which will play the leading role in the revolution as it unfolds in Massachusetts. And it's the marble headers that sit on all of the, 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 the committees of power 
in that government and they're making the crucial decisions and they're financing it with their own money too, which makes them very indispensable as well. Some of the richest men in the colonies are marbleheaders and fortune is made on cod. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out of sequence from what we had originally set up and follow up with the, a question on the Gardoki family and the question is, did they continue to support the Americans once independence was announced? They do. And this family is the mega trading house that, that, that the Marbleheaders have a relationship, a very, very close relationship. The Marbleheaders literally named their ships after the sons of this trading family. And they're very closely tied to them. And, um, and it's this relationship that proves to be indispensable during the early portion of the Revolutionary War. And later on, it's, it's, it's the son of this mega trading house that becomes America's first ambassador to America as the war goes forward. Really incredible story that's unknown, untold for the most part. Next question up is from uh, Jacob Vink of the Indiana uh, Society. And says, given the success of the Delaware crossing on December 25th and the racial diversity of the Marblehead regiments, were there any notable instances of soldiers or officers changing their opinions on integrated units? Hard to say if it was a change of opinion, but there are notable examples. Um, and one of them, I, or two of them I bring out in Washington's Immortals, the book you alluded to earlier, which is on the Maryland line. And it's a band of brothers, if you will, on, on, on the Marylanders. But the, the Marylanders story crosses lines with John Lawrence, who's actively trying to create a, um, a series of diverse regiments, or in many cases, um, African-American regiments to, to, to go into the fray. One of the other men in that, that story is Jack Stewart, who is I think one of the most extraordinary, interesting men in the in the Marblehead or in the um, with the, within the Maryland Regiment, Washington's Washington's Immortals, if you will. And um, Stewart is uh, his motto, personal model is you only live once, and he's a really reckless kind of daring guy that leads the forlorn hope at the Battle of Stony Point. This is a uh, really an interesting story. It's Forlorn hope is just that. They don't think that they're gonna make it. It's a suicide squad that goes in with axes and um, to, to cut apart the atabase, the, the, the atabase that's surrounding uh, Stony Point and then the first to make the penetration that allows the rest of the army to go through. And they, they successfully do it there. And Stuart um, is, is, is uh, decorated by Congress for his actions there, um, but Unfortunately, his his uh, his goal, along with Lawrence's role, a uh, goal, um, specifically their their idea, their um, their plan, um, didn't com fully come into fruition. I mean, the, the Rhode Island uh, regiment does successfully also is out there that does extraordinary things too during the American Revolution. I dedicate the book to these these men that I think are really unfor forgotten and unsung heroes especially the ones that are in the, the Marblehead Regiment. All right. Our next question is from Cliff Olson of the Missouri Society. Naval power was, as George Washington said, the pivot upon which everything turned. Congress authorized the licensing of privateers during the war, making it potentially more financially advantageous than Continental Naval Service. It seems this would make it hard to recruit sailors and Marines for the Navy. How was a balance kept between the two groups, the Continental Navy and the privateers? It was never really kept. It was a problem and a challenge. Um, let me just sort of go back a little bit. These men were never privateers per se. They were not private individuals. The, the men of the Marblehead Regiment were all part of the Continental Army. And therefore they fought in Washington's Navy or Washington's cruisers. They were all members of the Continental Army. They were not private citizens uh, in the phase of the book that I cover, which is up to 1777. Later on, many of these men do become privateers. And the important distinction is what I 
capture is the early precursor to the U.S. Navy. They're trying to they're trying to find a, a way to tackle this critical shortage of gunpowder, and they realize that there are a lot of ships out there that are British transports that are laden with with gunpowder. And if they could get their hands on one of those ships, it could change the course of the war. They do it multiple times. But there's also a lot of indirect benefits to this asymmetric type of warfare. These small craft are not necessary. They're not designed to go head on with the Royal Navy's great um, ships of the line. They're going after these vulnerable transports and they're very successful in, in, um, in capturing a number of prizes, but there's also a very interesting indirect result. The insurance rates for these commercial ships that are trying to supply the British army skyrockets and the economic costs to the crown are overwhelming and practically incalculable. Um, it's the, the insurance rates, it's the fact that what happens next is, it's almost like in World War I, where the, the Allies had to deal with the U-boat menace. They had to deal with these small ships that were fast and nimble, that were picking off vulnerable transports. They had to, they basically had to um, convoy them and they had to disperse their military assets to protect against these small ships. And this was a major problem. It, would, it was drawing away their sea power from other critical operations that they could have launched. And it was also bleeding them with um, these economic consequences uh, as well as taking longer to get supplies in. And the marble headers play a key role. It's, the, it's this origin of Washington's Navy that becomes an early precursor to the US Navy. They're, here they have to figure out how to use flags. They have our first flag is, is for, on board of one of Washington's cruisers, how to you know, organize a Navy. All of these things which are, are you know, to a nation that's just being a nascent nation is, is really extraordinary. It's also about sovereignty. When you create a Navy, you are going beyond um, trying to reconcile with the crown. You're creating an independent nation with a Navy. It's a big step and you also have to finance it. It's a, a lot of money. Um, these are all steps that are very important. And I get into uh, great detail um, with Washington's Navy and then how many of these captains, these Marblehead captains are the most successful of war. They become part of, they become the great captains of the US Navy. Uh, and then continue on. Yeah, you you lay that out very well. Um, and there's a couple of, I'm not going to give away anything, but there are some very good and interesting stories um, on that aspect or that portion of the book. Um, here's a question from Stephen Perkins of the Missouri Society. Uh, John Glover and many Marbleheaders went off to war, leaving much of Marblehead unprotected and unsupported. Can you expand on how dire the consequences were to the wives and families of Marblehead and what kind of lasting impact did it have on the families and the town? I think this is something most Americans have no appreciation for. One, the American Revolution, it's a miracle that it succeeded. Um, it was it was a miracle because it was a economic war against the, the greatest ec economic power in the world at the time. And we had the highest standard of living arguably in the world at the time. And it was also this growing economy, but it was devastated during the American revolution. And the town of Marblehead in particular was economically destroyed. Men that, that volunteered for the cause would lost their fortunes. And in most cases, the town, and the individuals in it were bankrupt. And, you know, the men go off to war and the sacrifice is extraordinary. I bring out a really interesting incident that I don't think many people know about. There was literally a food riot within Marblehead in 17, late 1776, where the women of the town were being denied uh, grain supplies and, and, and flour. And they literally took up arms with their with the muskets that were laying around and rioted and, and stormed um, the stores and, and received the food that they needed. Um, you know, it's, it's really an interesting dynamic uh, of what the, the sacrifice 
that these individuals made for our liberty. And it's, it's extraordinary and exceptional. I mean, we're, you're, go to Trenton, for instance, and you're dealing with individuals that didn't have shoes or winter clothing. And literally, the, it's, not a, it's, not a, um, it's not trite. They, these men were literally barefoot and they're, they were making bloody tracks as they marched towards Trenton in the snow. That's how difficult, and they marched everywhere. Most cases, they marched from Marblehead to, their, to the theater of operation. They marched all the way from Marblehead to New York, and they marched from Trenton back. So, I mean, this is, these, are, these are iron men and women by that point. Now, do you think some of that, some of the hardships that were taking place in Marblehead, were they a result of the loyalists? that didn't go off to war, that stayed behind, or were they fundamentally marginalized and, and... They were mostly marginalized. And, you know, we really get into, uh, I, um, I try to be very balanced in the way that I tell the story. I tell the story of the loyalist as well. And Ashley Bowen is one of those loyalists and he is a rigger and a sailmaker and his, you know, He's a hero to some degree in the sense that he, in the French and Indian War, saved many lives by, by sailing back um, many men that fought with the British in Marblehead. Uh, and it, it, this, there's really kind of an epic story that I tell there. But during the Revolution, he sticks by his principles of being a loyalist and does not uh, join Glover's regiment. And as a result, he's canceled. He is ostracized from work. And his family is starving. It's, it's a miracle that he somehow finds a way to avoid service and then also avoid um, starving to death. Um, but a lot of the loyalists, some of the most wealthy men in Marblehead are, 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 are deeply aligned with General Gage. And General Gage stays in um, another guy, Robert King Co uh, Hooper, is a main character in my book. And he is a loyalist and he is the counterpart of Jeremiah Lee, who's one of the, they're, the both men are some of the richest men in the colonies, but Hooper is, is Gage's best friend. And they, they, he, st Gage stays in his, his summer home uh, in 1774, 75. Um, you know, it's, it, there's a really interesting dynamic uh, going on uh, within the, the colonies. And, um, you know, also my main character, Dr. Nathaniel Bond, who sets up the hospital, the inoculation hospital at Cat Island and inoculates many Marbleheaders is um, I think one of the most interesting stories in the book, quite frankly. I have his original letter that he wrote. During the Battle of Lexington and Concord, he treated British soldiers that were there, that were, that were dying. And as a result, he was canceled they thought that he was a loyalist from his just following his Hippocratic oath. And uh, what happens next is his home is surrounded by a mob and they try to kill him. And he writes this, this, this desperate letter to Elbridge Gary that I own demanding that they send an armed group for court martial. And he does that. He goes to court martial and he, and he, he lays out the facts and he's exonerated publicly by Dr. Church, who's a close friend, as well as Joseph Warren, who's later the president of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. And these men are all very close friends. But the interesting thing is, instead of not serving and just going home and just disappearing, Dr. Bond stays on and is a fighting company commander, a surgeon and company commander within the Marblehead Regiment. And when a por portion of the regiment after the Battle of Trenton goes home, Dr. Bond stays and he volunteers. And like many of those volunteers, it costs him his life, but he also saves the United States by what many argue is Washington's greatest strategic decision to inoculate the army. Because at this time, the army was suffering from 20% or more uh, casualties from smallpox. It wasn't bullets. It was the virus that was killing the army. And Washington decides to inoculate it, which is an incredibly important strategic decision because it allows the army to fight on. But it's Dr. Bond that sets up all the inoculation hospitals 
And he, he also conducts many of the inoculations, but he dies as a result of his service to the United States, but he saves our country. Another reason why, you know, it's a marblehead that proves to be indispensable. Well, that's a nice segue to, to the next question. As the group of doctors, Bond, Warren, and Church, were all involved in some interesting uh, and not well-known um, intrigues. The next question comes up is, can you expand upon how the Committee of Conspiracies became the origin for the OSS and the CIA? It's not directly an origin, um, but it's the CIA that a few years ago comes up and says that this, that John Jay is the father of American counterintelligence. And it's the Committee of Conspiracies that John Jay and other very notable New Yorkers form. What happens after the, um, the siege of Boston and Dorchester Heights um, are captured and we start to shell Boston Harbor, Lord Howe retreats. They reassemble in Nova Scotia and they plan the greatest um, invasion in North American history. They decide to invade New, New York. Washington has, has anticipates this and he's ordered to go to New York to defend the impossible. It's a, <laughs> I mean, New York is surrounded by water, so it's impossible to defend against the greatest naval power in the world at the time. But what, what's going on in New York City is the governor himself, the loyalist, is actively plotting to different ways to disrupt Washington's plans. And Washington, and well, Jay, specifically, they come up with something called the Committee of Conspiracies or the cons Committee of the Intestine, which is kind of a cool, obscure term. But they're trying to look into the internal aspects of what's going on with the loyalists. And this is counterintelligence. And this committee is looking at conspiracies and things that are people are actively trying to undermine the, the cause. And what's quite interesting is it's Washington's guard themselves that are involved in one of these plots. And Washington's guard or the commander in chief's guard or the lifeguard is led by a marbleheader. He leads it and he also forms the, the guard and there's many mar there's marbleheaders that are in the guard. And that's one of the more intriguing stories in, in, in the book. Um, it's about trying to kill Washington and it's the guard themselves that are that are going after the commander in chief, but it's the guard that disrupts it. And, and that that rolls into the next question. This isn't one that we uh, prepped we prepped you with, but I, I came up with it as I was uh, getting ready for the interview today. How did the mission of Washington's lifeguard evolve over the course of the war? And were there any other instances of treachery within the ranks? Well, the guard um, initially is formed to protect the commander in chief and to guard his papers. And um, it, it expands. I mean, it's really quite interesting. Washington wants a elite core that will protect him, but also in some cases, the guard's role evolves into special missions. And in some cases, even in battle, they're utilized. It's not a small unit either. It, it, it begins with about you know, less than 100 men or 70 men, and then it mushrooms into about 250. And um, they are, you know, they're there where the where Washington, you know, is battling. But it's interesting, Washington himself doesn't like to have, you know, literally 50 or 100 guys of the guard always surrounding him. He usually rides alone or with a, with a couple aides, and as well as his, um, is African-American manservant, Billy Lee. He's kind of, it's only a couple guys. He's always usually moving around, which makes him in some cases vulnerable, but this is the commander in chief. He is, he's in the forefront. Um, many of the battles, it's, it's remarkable. It's Washington himself that's there. It's, it's, a, it's true leadership. He doesn't do any, you know, he doesn't demand anything that he won't do himself. And it's like, he puts himself in harm's way. And, there's some extraordinary stories that are unexplainable. I mean, literally hundreds of bullets flying around the commander in chief, but he's impervious. 
at the Battle of Princeton, for instance, he is in the fray. He's in the forefront. He's leading from the front and changes the course of the battle. The same with Battle of Assunpink Creek, the Second Battle of Trenton. They hold the key bridge with Washington's leadership. But the guard is in, involved in all these battles, and their their role does change. And there's different. There are other there is other assassination attempts that are made on the commander in chief's life. But um, you know, it's it's uncanny. Washington is, um, despite all the you know, impossible odds, is is protected. Well, and his his invulnerability, and some say it's a. Um... A divine uh, intervention, but that goes all the way back to his early life in the French and Indian War, of having his uniform pierced, having um, people around him die, having artillery shells fly by him. But he, he truly was <laughs> bulletproof in that regard. Indeed, and, it, and it's remarkable. And yeah, where would we have been without him? Uh, if 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 the um, I mean. Washington was the indispensable man, man of the Revolutionary War. I mean, he was not only a battlefield leader, but he was able to, to pull together Americans that were deeply divided during the American Revolutionary War. And he had that ability to, um, to work with foreign powers and leaders, something you don't see until with an American general until John J. Pershing. Um, you know, he's able to, to build and forge alliances and change strategy midway through the war. I mean, it's just, he's remarkable. And if, if he's the indispensable man, these were the indispensable men that he relied upon uh, over and over throughout the course of the revolution, Marbleheaders. You bring up a lot of great characters and you introduce some, some really well-known uh, names and you fill in some blanks on, on people like uh, Jerry and, and uh, John Glover. Uh, the men of color within the men, uh, within the, Marblehead Regiment. Uh, do you know what happened to some of the other personalities that you introduce in your book? Manuel Soto, Caesar Glover, Emmanuel and Romeo uh, that served with Gabriel Jonat, uh, and what happened to them through the war and after the war? I think this is the one of the tragedies of, of the American Revolution is many of the men of color, they just disappear after the war. And it's only if they were lucky enough to survive to 1820 and then beyond where they have the opportunity to apply for a federal pension where they could go down to the local courthouse and swear under oath what they saw and did. And then also records their possessions that they have because they have to prove that they're not, you know, some extremely wealthy individual. And with Glo Caesar Glover, we know that he was a very uh, poor individual that was a laborer after the war and um, didn't have much. Uh, just like many of these men, um, the war destroys them financially. Even John Glover, who's a very wealthy man before the war, is really his fortune is, is, is considerably diminished. Um, in, he's in very bad shape. And like many of the men, based on the, the letters that he wrote, he suffered from uh, PTSD based on the, the, what he said in his letters. I mean, he couldn't sleep, et cetera. He had all these night tremors and things, and uh, nightmares, et cetera. But the, um, many of the uh, African-American or men of color in the unit, it's very sad. Their, their legacy is, if they didn't apply for the pension, is, is, is unknown to time. Uh, I really... I did a genealogy on each one of these men, basically, which was an enormous undertaking. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I literally, I, I, I felt so strongly about their service that I dedicated the book to them in particular. Well, all right. Um, I would like to thank you so very much for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, that runs us through the full series of questions. Um, I, I cannot recommend this book enough, uh, and this and Patrick's other books. Uh, if you're a history buff, you're interested in the history of the intelligence service, uh, current operations in Fallujah with the Marine Corps, uh, the Korean War, uh, the, the Boys of Point to Hope in um, Dog Company, 
just a great series of books. You can find uh, more at uh, his website, uh, and we're going to show that um, in the closing comments there. Um, anything else you'd like to close with or, or add? No, I just like to say that it's really, Brooks, it's been a pleasure and an honor um, spending this hour with you this afternoon. And I, I really, you know, appreciate what your, your organization is doing um, by, um, by helping defend the re revolution and our origin story, which is our most precious story. And uh, I just thank you for the opportunity to, to present to you the indispensables this afternoon. All right. Well, thank you very much, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you.